Hello, and welcome everybody to this stream yard. We are taking a look with our panel here at the state of the races for election 2024. And my guest here, my panelists with me are broadcast journalist Will Silverstein for our sister station KBAK and Republican strategist Brittany Martinez coming to us out of Washington, D.C. Correct, Brittany? Yes. Welcome. Glad to see both of you. All right. We're in this strange sort of lull period right now. We've got three months till the first uh, the Republican uh, National Convention in uh, J in uh, July 15th starts in Milwaukee, and a, another month after that before the Democrat uh, Convention, and we finish the primaries. So we're in this kind of quiet period that's going to go away before long. Let's take a look at the races right now. What's happening in these races? Where are we? Leading from the numbers and where we came from from the primaries. And I'm talking about specific races that particularly impact Central California and the Senate race, by the way, but uh, like District 5, District 13, District 20, and the special election there, District 21, District 22. All right, let's talk about that. First of all, as you look at these races, both of you, do any of them particularly catch your eye? Any comments you want to make about what you see there? I think the one that catches most of people's eye right now uh, is going to be the special election race, especially because there's such, uh, it's coming up so soon. Uh, for us. I mean, we have this very tight window where we've had a, uh, an election at the beginning of March for a primary and a second one on the 19th. Now, all of a sudden, we have a third date where people are receiving ballots for, uh, and it's between two Republicans, which you don't see that often. So it'll be interesting to see what voter turnout is going to be like in that race for the succession of Kevin McCarthy's seat in Congress. Well, taking a look at that special election, Let's see what we can glean from, from the primary that's already passed. And we have uh, the District 20 special election. There is a 42.3% of the vote, 51,194 for Vince Vaughn, 25.8% from Mike Kudrow. Is that, I mean, already, if you just go at face value, things have changed, maybe, not as not so much since then, but we'll continue to evolve, I presume, as, as the race and campaigns go on. But what do those numbers tell you for that? Well, I'll say that I think it's pretty interesting. Uh, we also have the percentage from Wood, um, who will no longer be in that special election or in a general election for November. She won with 20 or she had 23 percent of the vote. So I wonder what's going to happen when we have two Republican voters going for the special. Are those voters going to turn out? Are they going to vote for a Republican? Or are they just going to stay home and not go to the ballot box? True. And then there were, Marissa Wood had the uh, lion's portion of the Democrat vote out there, apart from Adam Schiff, those who, the, the top two. But there are other Democrat votes there too. So when you tally them all together, that's a lot of votes. And I have a hard time thinking that they won't go out and vote just because uh, their initial candidate isn't there. Will, your thoughts? Yeah, I think the interesting thing here is going to be looking at where those votes go and why are they going to a certain place? Uh, you know, uh, Donald Trump and uh, Kevin McCarthy have endorsed Vince Fong in this race. Now, some people may think that Mike Boudreau is perhaps more conservative on a few more issues than what Vince Fong is. Uh, so do those Democrat voters then just go to Boudreau, who's actually a more conservative candidate, because they are looking to spite the efforts of Kevin McCarthy and Donald Trump? That's going to be a very interesting thing to watch in this race, to see if that's where Democrat voters are motivated to go, because they may not agree with a lot of political positions that both candidates have. Yeah. And there are a lot of votes still in play from those other candidates who are now not in the race. Brittany? Yeah, and just to add to that, we have two really qualified candidates here. We have Vince Fong, an assemblyman, and also he was the former district director for former Speaker Kevin McCarthy. And we have uh, Boudreau uh, as a Tulare County Sheriff. And so they both come with their own records and their own uh, accountability responsibilities that they shared with with voters and uh, their own wins. So it'll be interesting to see how this turns out in just about a month. Now, since we're talking about the special election, let's just go into the general election for the 20th District too. And um, again, similar proportions here. 41.9 percent of the vote is what Vince Fong won in that primary with 66,160. Mike Pedro, 24 percent. Uh, of that vote, 37,883. All right, the Congressional District uh, full term coming up in District 20. Um, again, a similar picture. You had a very similar slate, not completely similar, but a very similar slate of other candidates. Now they're not in the race. Where those votes will go is somewhat anybody's guess. You know what would be interesting is if we could get a breakdown of where these votes came from. You know, every candidate has their 
strong areas. As we mentioned, Tulare County Sheriff Mike Madrill, Tulare County is considered pretty strong for him. It'd be interesting to see where these different votes are. We can't do that in the scope of this particular stream yard. I'd like to do it in the future maybe, but uh, that would tell us a bit more about where they might go, I think. Well, we, we did notice that in, in those counties, it looked like in Tulare and Kings were uh, some strong suits for, uh, for, for Mike Boudreau, uh, it, as you would imagine with being the county uh, sheriff there. But actually, Fresno, Vince Vaughn performed very well, which a lot of the thought would be that further north you went, Mike Boudreau would continue to do well. But once you got outside that county, uh, Vince Fong still has some really big name recognition up in Fresno, and that's a part of the area that, uh, you know, Kevin McCarthy is represented. So not too surprising to see him there, but showing that that area may be a pivotal few thousand votes that could go either way uh, once, uh, you know, we've seen this Democrat and the rest of those Republicans who have lost in this race removed from the race, and it's just this head-on competition. Yeah. And again, with so many votes in play there, it'll be very interesting to see which way that lays out. Of course, a lot to happen here between now and the campaign is yet to be made out there to the voters. All right, let's move on to the... Um, what was one of the closest races in 2022, and that's the 22nd district race. That's David Valadeo and uh, Rudy Salas. So you taking a look at that? What do you guys think about that one? Uh, I'll start by saying that, you know, as a former McCarthy staffer who often worked with Valadeo's team, he is one of my favorite members of Congress. He is totally unproblematic and at a time where a lot of members are threatening to vacate the current speaker and are just causing all of this chaos, he really does stay above the fray and keeps delivering solutions uh, for Central Valley residents. And so though I know that it was a close race last time, I know that he's pre previous lost in the past and then ran again and won, Thankfully, uh, I think he's a great legislator. When we look at the primary, he's only up by a point and a half. And so some people might say, you know what, that means that Salas has a really good chance here. And I'm not saying that he's not, that he doesn't, but Valadeo is just so well known in the community. He's well respected, he's loved. And I think people like the fact that he just goes to DC, gets the job done, and then just minds his own business. I think that's going to work well for him here. And on By the, the way, topic of to mention, oh yes, yeah, sir, go ahead. Give me one second. Well, I wanted to mention it, Victor. Yeah. You are a Republican strategist. We did invite Democrat strategists too. None of them were available for this particular stream yard. We hope to have them in future. Sorry, we'll continue, please. No, I was going to say, and, and when Brittany's talking about minding your business, he's not endorsing anybody in that other race just yet. Uh, it seems like he probably won't for that primary election, just to give you an idea of him not really wanting to put his foot out in water that uh, he doesn't feel like he needs to step into. So that, I think, is maybe one of the most interesting things, too, as it goes back to his race, is maybe seeking to keep things, as, as Brittany was saying, towards the legislation that he has put forward, and less towards those political issues of the day that you see you know, taking news headlines. He's looking for more solution uh, type, he's more of a solution type of legislator, maybe more than someone who's putting his name in the headlines uh, every day. Well, for what it's worth, I took a look again at the numbers for the, the uh, primary this year again, and I compared them to the, uh, the general from 2022, the close race we talked about, and the primary from 2022. And for what it's worth, I don't know that it's worth much. We're talking about two completely different primaries and situations. Uh, in uh, in the 2022 primary, um, I, it, I, and I have to double check this because it looks like Valadeo had fewer votes than Salas in that primary, as I remember, and and that that reversed itself in the general election of 2022, and now so I mean just comparisons sake, it looks like uh, um, Valadeo is doing better in this particular uh, primary than the prior primary in 2022. I have to check those numbers again. All right. Any, any last thoughts about this race, the Congressional District 2022? 20, I was just going to add, I think that's a great point that you bring up, Monty. Um, if that is a bellwether for anything, I guess that means that he's in a better spot now than he was in 2022, and he was able to bring that win home. So uh, I think we'll have another Congressman Valadeo term and uh, hopefully many more to come. But, you know, that's just my two cents. And we shall see. All right. Let's particularly move this on to the um, 21st District. Will, have you been watching that one? I have been watching that race a little bit. It is, it is an interesting race. And that's the, uh, is that the uh, Costa one, if, I'm, in, if I may? Costa and Maher. Yes. Michael Maher. Right. Yes. He, he ran in 2022 uh, and uh, lost to Costa. Costa, of course, is a veteran, been around a long time, faced many challenges. Um, in the 2022 primary, just again for background on this race, uh, Costa had 47% of that vote, Maher 26.4. And I, I think that was his 
his maiden run there that first time he ran. Now, that was in the 2022 primary. This latest primary, big change. Costa has 53% of the vote, but Meyer has 47%. And that's he's come up a long way. And that's even up from the 2022 general election where Meyer had 45.8%. It's up a little bit to 47% now. So he can be pleased with the fact that he's made solid progress in his uh, voter support there. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Go ahead, Brittany. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Well, I was going to say I've spoke with another uh, Republican strategist who says this is really a race to watch and, and about the future of the Central Valley and how voters look. Obviously, uh, as, as Brittany had talked about with Valadeo sort of uh, securing all these voters that he wasn't able to get uh, during the primary go around, the last go around in uh, 2022. This is a race where, uh, as you said, Mars is polling very well and looks to be someone who uh, maybe has uh, the ability to change the political landscape of the Central Valley, especially after those two races in the Democrat-leaning districts, in the Valadeo district, and then in the uh, Gray Duarte district that we'll talk about later. Maybe this is the next step going to a district that's even more solidly Democrat for Republicans to take advantage. Maybe so. It's, a, it's certainly a good one to watch here. All right. We talked about a close race from last year. That was the Valadeo Salas race. How about an even closer one? We're talking about the 13th district congressional uh, race there. John Duarte and Adam Gray. All right, before I say anything, again, please, Brittany, any thoughts on that one? Yeah, so I was looking at all the polling data uh, today to refresh myself, and I, it was only, it was 50.2% to 49.8%. Duarte took that win home. But when we look at the primary polling this time, it's 55 to 45. So similar to Valadeo, I think that Duarte is in the better position now than he was in last year's or last time in 2022. Um, in that primary. And I think that's just going to position him to take it home again. I mean, he's polling above 50% in a primary. Uh, so who's to say what will happen in the next few months? It's still only April, but polls look good for him right now. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, a big factor in this too will be the money yet to be spent in the campaigns coming forward. So that is going to have an impact. But just to recap, the difference in that vote, you're right, very close. 574 votes, 0.4%, 0.4%. And that's true in the uh, in the primaries. That was a different story. It was about nine, a little over 9% uh, change. So uh, a difference between the two. So that's a, that's a significant difference. Again, from what we can tell about the primaries compared to the upcoming general. Will? Yeah, I think this is a race that uh, is considered kind of similar to that Valadeo um, uh, Salas race. And that yeah. you're going to get this, you're, you know, it's almost the, I think people in the district won't like to hear this, but it's almost the exact carbon copy of the of the race down here. And I think the reason why people in the district don't want to hear it is because uh, they're looking for candidates that probably speak to their issues as more than just the stats of the district. And of course, this is a little bit more north toward uh, toward Fresno uh, and in those outlying areas north of Fresno, I believe. So uh, it, there's major differences between the people that live in that district and people that live in this district. And yet, uh, they are still uh, being represented by a couple of Republicans who are narrowly getting these votes in lower turnout races. All right, let's move on to one more district. And I know this is very far north of your area down there. We're talking about Congressional District 5, Tom McClintock, the incumbent, Mike Barkley, his Democrat challenger, many times Democrat challenger. This is Barkley's run many times there. Uh, he's very persistent there. And uh, how that might turn out. And I, I'll, I'll have you know that I have had the opportunity to just interview Tom McClintock just a couple days ago before the stream yard. So um, very much watching this race too. In the primary, Tom McClintock at 58.5% of the vote. Again, veteran congressman from that district. Mike Barkley, the Democrat challenger, had 32.8. Interesting story here. Barkley has been running, I, I, from what I looked at, at least four or five times in the past. He's come up from getting a nominal 1,000 votes, 2000, steadily 2,000, 3,000. As of this primary, he had 66,680 votes. That's a very credible showing. So his persistence is really, his campaign is really um, an exercise and example of persistence in his uh, in political endeavors. I love perseverance. I love gumption. Uh, unfortunately for Barkley though, McClintock in this primary is at uh, 25.76 points above him, which is actually higher than he was in the general election in 2022, which was 22.6 points ahead of him. So similarly to some of these themes that we're seeing here, though I can appreciate the civil discourse and the passion, I think that McClintock's got it in the bag. I will tell you that uh, I've, I've had the pleasure of interviewing both men 
Talmud Bittik, I find to be um, in the mold of what at least we used to call statesmen, pretty dignified, uh, very experienced. And he has a way of expressing himself in uh, quotes from Abraham Lincoln speeches, which I think is a very solid place to be. Who's going to criticize you if you're quoting uh, Abraham Lincoln on a particular uh, issue or topic? And then the other thing, uh, Mike Barkley also, he's Democrat. And uh, whether I agree or not agree with his positions, he's very genuine, very sincere. And they, uh, all of his positions, whether you're good or not, come from a very good place. Uh, that's say, from being both of them. Yeah, I mean, with this with this one, you have, uh, you know, I guess if, you, if they both go by honest, Dave, they're both honest, then you got to go by what the, the county leans and does lean slightly Republican. And, and I think there's something to the effect of having an incumbent who has, uh, you know, gained the trust of, of the people over the years, no matter how tight the district is, because it, it shows a, a model of consistency. And I think that's what voters are looking like there. That said, if voters are frustrated, they may be interested uh, you know, in, in trying something new by also, I guess, trying something old, someone who's lost a number of times. That said, the primary numbers that Brittany referenced are pretty uh, are pretty tough to, to overcome. Okay. Finally, the uh, California State, actually not finally, one more after this. California State Assembly District 8, again, that's for kind of far north of you, Will, but that's the uh, veteran George Rodanovich and uh, his challenger, David Tangipa. Challenger, they're both challengers, there's no incumbent in this race. Um, interesting, close race. Mm, slightly under 5% difference in percentage points uh, from the primary between Tangipa and Rodanovich. Anybody want to venture any uh, observations here? Well, you're right. It was a pretty close primary. Um, and, you know, it's interesting that I was thinking about this is that we saw David Shepard, who was going for the 16th Senate seat last time. People will say, like, we want new leadership. We want young people. Um, and excuse me, I'm sure I'm going to pronounce this wrong. Uh, Tangipa is a, a younger gentleman. Um, however, when we look at Radonovich, he is a former member of Congress. He's got the resume. He's got uh, the experience, the pedigree. And so I think that he's going to be the one to end up taking it home. Uh, but again, appreciate people throwing their hat in the ring. It's so important to especially younger generations. And so we'll see how things turn out because it still is a really tight race. So it's still too close to call. Youth or experience, the choice is on the, the yeah. ballot here. Yeah, right. yeah. Well, well, I was just going to say too, it's going to be interesting to see because Republicans are going to be in the super major uh, minority in the state assembly. So then the question comes to: Can you put someone in who's going to be maybe an ideological uh, representative of Republicans uh, across California? Or do you want someone who's maybe going to get things done uh, if they can get into the assembly and try and push forward as much legislation as they can? Uh, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in a house where they are the minority. Well, you know, um, since the primaries, it's hard to track where things are in these individual races. I check the polls regularly, but not very many polls that I found on each of these individual races. I will begin now checking to see if I can find any internal polling from some of these campaigns for the future stream yard and future reporting to find out what status changes there may be that they're seeing in these races. Last question. Let's talk about the Senate race, the uh, California Senate race. And of course, we've got the that set now, Steve Garvey, Adam Schiff. Your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, in, it, you know, everything says this is, you know, Adam Schiff's seat to lose, and it, it likely is. Uh, you know, Wait, he, I want to I challenge you on that one just a little bit, though. It's sure, a very ahead. interesting phenomena that Garvey wins the special election on that, and uh, yeah. Schiff wins the other. And so it's it's kind of it's kind of curious juxtaposition there and what happened. And I mean, I, that suggests to me that, you know, it's that, that puts a big question mark on which way this will still finally end up when you see that. Yeah, oh, I, I agree. I think the thing will be, though, once you start adding the percentages of Katie Porter, when you throw her 15 percent or so in there, then all of a sudden, you know, you're four percent away from from 50. I mean, the, the big question is, is, you know, can. Can Schiff continue to hold on to all those people who voted for Barbara Lee and maybe some other niche unknown Democrats who maybe are frustrated right now with uh, with uh, you know Democrats in Washington and perhaps with Schiff in particular they're they're more progressive would they be willing to sit out uh, in the general election if they voted for Lee in the early one but you know uh, I, you know Steve Garvey today is you know I believe he spoke at USC uh, these uh, this uh, protest uh, for you know, trying to uh, speak up for some of the Jewish students on campus in the wake of all the uh, uh, 
uh, protests that have been going on around there. So maybe he's doing things that maybe other Republicans, uh, you know, who are more conservative than he is, as he's positioned himself as moderate, wouldn't be doing. He's maybe trying to present in that statesman manner that uh, I think maybe a lot of people are missing out on. Brittany? Yeah, I mean, it's tough to win statewide as a Republican in California. The last person to do so, if I'm right, was Arnold Schwarzenegger, I think. And he's also a, a movie star. Um, so I'm a Republican. Obviously, I want us to see us do well. I think it's great that Garvey is in this race. Uh, I think that he gives people an option because oftentimes just across the country down the ballot, or excuse me, across California down the ballot, it's Democrat versus Democrat. And so now we actually have an opportunity for a Republican to potentially Potentially take a statewide office. Do I think that's what's necessarily going to happen? Unfortunately not. Uh, I think that he is the closest that we'll get to a statewide candidate maybe in a few years, but he does bring, you know, that former Dodger player, that sort of Hollywood-esque or adjacent um, wow factor that we've been missing in some of our candidates, I would argue, in the last several years. Um, so I, I'm glad he's in the race and giving people a, a, an option. Well, judging by his vote, a whole lot of people are glad he's in the race. I want to thank you both. That concludes our stream round right now. Uh, thanks for both being here. We're taking a look at that state of the races. Check your numbers with me, and we can circle back again now, maybe in a, in a few weeks or another month or so, and, and talk again about where we see things going. But for now, from uh, Fox 26 News and and KBAK and, uh, and Brittany Martinez, your Republican <laughs> strategist, and California Votes 2024, we thank you for watching this state of the races panel. Good day.